and welcome on Watches TV and welcome on Primetime Watchmaking in the News, where we talk about business, trends, and obviously watches. And I have to admit that this is probably the dancer fall period I've witnessed since a very long time, or actually since ever. And we have therefore many stories to share with you, important auctions to occur in the, with a selection of pieces from the main houses, plenty of new pieces and some heavy ones uh, from Patek, Omega, Laurent Ferrier, Oberg, others and even Rolex. But we also have uh, some news to share regarding the future of Watches and Wonder among other stories. And before jumping in, and, uh, and as a quick reminder, well, now you have our show available as a podcast and you can find it on Spotify or Apple Podcast. All right, so let's quickly start with the upcoming GPHG ceremony, aka Watchmaking's Oscar, occurring on the 10th of November. So we've been uh, naturally waiting for this event since a little while, uh, seen a lot of pre-selected watches, and finally at the beginning of October, we found out who exactly will be on the distinguished uh, jury. Personally, I was quite happy to see new blood among uh, well-known experts. And just to let you know, uh, well, we'll do some kind of debrief after the ceremony, sharing our own thoughts in the video to be published only a few days after it. But something to be noted regarding this year's edition is that generally all the pre-selected watches go on some kind of world tour in four or five different cities. But this year, this was reduced to only two, but totally new places with New Delhi and Marrakesh. And actually, I wonder why only two? I don't know. Well, in the meantime, and in the coming days, uh, uh, all the main auction houses will have their sales going and it will be, of course, be um, interesting to see what will happen. And I say this because we know that the secondary market has been sizably shaken in the past few months, adjusting more to some kind of reality. And the total crazy craziness we all witness, uh, well, till this summer, does seem to be behind us. But will this have some consequences on the result of these sales? Well. We will soon find out, but I'm pretty sure that this new reality won't have much impact on the most coveted vintage and meaningful pieces. So let's jump more into details of these auctions. Following the huge success of the spring sales where Phillips took the lead, uh, followed by Christie's and Sotheby's, well, we are now heading towards another round of battles for the rare and important timepieces. This summer, experts have already predicted that the fall season will be record-breaking and the overall sales in 2022 are likely to surpass 900 million Swiss rank. And if we look at the abundance and quality of lots, well, it seems to be true. So the watches department of Sotheby's did a quite a good job for, to fulfill bidders' uh, hunger for rare top uh, quality and sometimes never seen timepieces. And the most interesting among them is lot number 95. It is a Vacheron Constantin Chocolatone, reference uh, 4764, a possibly unique platinum triple date wristwatch uh, with moon phase uh, from 1958. It was bought in Greece and remained there. And to date, well, it is the only one, the platinum uh, Chocolatone reference in the archives of Bachelon Constantin. Next with lot 104, Daytona reference 6263, an early and very rare iteration of this Rolex model, which was originally owned by the present ruler of the Kingdom of Bahrain, His Majesty King Hamad bin Im Salman Al Khalifa, who was the crown prince at the time and the watch given to his falconer. So another royal wristwatch would be lot 94, a fine yellow gold brigade that was sold in 1955 to the house of Prince Michel de Bourbon Parme. And lot 83 has no royal provenance, but this Longines Lindbergh Hour Angle reference 3210 is nevertheless one of the most iconic watches produced by Longines and used by pilots for their navigation needs. Yeah, no computer at the time. So there are as well two outstanding pieces from FP Jaune, lot 66, a platinum tourbillon souverain à remontoir d'égalité with a brass movement, always beautiful. And lot 65, a uh, pl platinum resonance pre-production. I mean, the latter is believed to be one of only 10 pieces and represents the very first resonance uh, watch ever made. But if you are keen on picking something unique, then lot 39 might be your choice. Uh, this Daytona Zenith reference uh, 165023 has a cœur de ruby dial, and uh, it's an incredible fragile stone and seldomly used in watchmaking. It is for the first time a Daytona with a cœur de ruby dial that has been available at auction. And if you want an original ruby light dial, well, it could be found at Philips, which has collected this time quite a wide range of Rolexes, apparently trying to repeat its success of the, the spring period. So the ruby light dial Rolex is lot number 11, but there are surely more captivating pieces in this autumn set. For instance, lot 40, the oyster 
Bristol Chronograph with a tropical dial, which once belonged to the musical legend Eric Clapton and, I mean, savvy watch collector. A highly unusual Cartier Crasher could be found on the number uh, 96. And apart from being a desired collectible, it is a limited edition pink gold wristwatch with uh, appealing burgundy uh, numerals. And of course, I mean, you have the Audemars Piguet Grand Complication, which is lot 1965. It is signed Audemars Piguet Genève, which is quite rare and was used only for the timepieces produced until the 70s when AP had its workshop in Geneva, or at least one of its workshops. Another detail worth mentioning is that uh, in this watch, both chronograph split second hands are of different color, a small but uh, useful distinctive feature that was somehow lost in the last half century. But the main highlight for Philips will undoubtedly be three George Daniel timepieces, starting with lots 27, with the spring case tourbillon, a very original piece where you can uh, flip uh, the piece while keeping it on your wrist. So on one side, you have time indication, and, the, uh, and on the other one, calendar information on top of this beautiful view of the tourbillon. Next is lot 30, part of the anniversary collection, number 24 of 35. And finally, lot uh, 141 called the Millennium with coaxial escapement, a development fully associated with the great uh, British watchmaker. So yes, quite unique to have three examples of his work sold during the same auction and it should reach quite significant numbers. And Christie's decided to stick to the name of its uh, auction uh, called Legendary and Unique Watches and picked a set of five unique FP Jouan models in platinum with uh, ruthenium plated brass movements, lot 2025 through 2029. An automatic annual calendar, a day night uh, octa, an automatic flyback chronograph, a resonance and a tourbillon souverain. And I think that in this case, the provenance matters a great deal because these pieces were originally gifted uh, to their owner by the legendary Michael Schumacher. And for sure, some very nice gift. And I guess we can all guess who the lucky guy was uh, who got them. And there are some other clues with some of the other watches put on sale by Christie's. So another exceptional piece uh, from this sale is a personalized platinum, highly complicated Toric Westminster minute repeater from Parmigiani Fleury. It is lot uh, 2070 and it differs from the latest story collection of the brand, not only because it is semi-skeletonized, it replicates the chime of the iconic Big Ben clock of the House of Parliament in London. And on its case back, it features the engraving of two speeding horses overlaid with a translucent enamel. So I would also like to mention lot uh, 2082, which is a very, very uh, interesting piece uh, uh, from Chopin with an affordable price, so probably underrated for what it is. So it might be a good deal. It is the first generation of the LUC uh, line launched in 1996 by uh, Carl Friedrich Schäufele. And this tourbillon is full of independent certification. Chopin is the only brand which has always certified its tourbillon with the chronometer COSC certification. And the last big piece offered by Christie's is the Rolex Polyumen Lemon Dial Daytona, reference 6263. The lemon dial of this lot one, uh, 128 is extremely rare, if not unique, and this is why it is estimated between three to five million Swiss franc. Well, I will stop here and let you discover a more impressive and striking collectible uh, by yourself on the auctions website. It's uh, really fully packed with watches and the overall result uh, from these three auction houses should indeed reach astronomical levels. And I didn't mention lots put on auction by Antiquorum, but there too you have some very uh, nice models uh, put on sale with a more affordable price range. So. Just go and check it out. And if you're in the Geneva vicinity prior to these sales, well, that's just an amazing opportunity to see an amazing range of watches by attending the previews held by these houses. I really encourage you to go there. And as a quick reminder, Philips is on November 5 and 6, uh, same dates as Antiquorum. Christie's uh, legendary uh, and unique watches and rare watches are on November 6 and 7. And Sotheby's important watches is on November 9. Okay, let's talk business and uh, one bad news for those of you who decided to go on a watch shopping uh, in the UK. Well, no more tax refunds for foreigners. Sorry guys, I know that in our last prime time we said that it would be uh, cheaper to go and buy new watches in uh, London and have a kind of uh, discount because of the weak pound on one side plus VAT returns. But life is life and things do change fast on the island. So the fact is that uh, the new head of Britain's uh, treasury uh, cancelled the idea of his predecessor 
to bring back VAT rebates in the UK for overseas visitors. Apparently, this uh, show of generosity would have costed the Treasury £2 billion per year. So, yeah, no luck for uh, the luxury market uh, there, even though retailers believe tourists will spend at least twice as much if they would have benefited from this tax-free uh, policy. All right, okay, next news and somewhat related to what we've been talking also in our last prime time, transparency. Breitling uh, claims to have launched the first ever fully traceable watch Super Chronomat Automatic 38 Origin. Its goal can be tracked to a single mine and its uh, lab-grown diamonds uh, to a single producer. So the launch came with the announcement that all the watches of the brand would be 100% traceable by 2025. It is indeed a good intention, although it is not new to the luxury uh, market. In 2019, LVMH started using blockchain to trace the origin of its goods. And there also exists the Responsible Jewelry Council, RGC, with its uh, change of custody certification that gives your customers and suppliers the assurance they need about how your products and materials have been sourced, traced and processed through the supply chain. So one of the benefits of such uh, transparency is that uh, it helps to protect your watch from counterfeits, making it uh, easier for the final customer to check the authenticity of each timepiece, which is, I mean, of course, extremely good for some brands. And on the other hand, supply chain tracing is not unified. I mean, there exist many blockchain platforms, including Aura Blockchain Consortium from LVMH, but it is uh, still not comprehensive and lacks independent brands. And here I have a question for you guys because it is always great to hear uh, your ideas as, uh, as well. I mean, we like this. So for you, how important as a final consumer uh, is it to know the origin of the materials of your watch, uh, uh, where it's made out of uh, from? Would you be ready to pay more for such knowledge or is it just total marketing for you? Well, feel free to comment below uh, this video. So still in the industry news section, well, we have uh, finally heard some info regarding next year's Watches and Wonder uh, set to occur in spring. As I have mentioned a few times, I still believe in the pertinence of such a show as long as there is some evolution to the format. Well, this is not yet totally clear and I believe that we will experience a transitional edition in 2023, but the big news is that Watches and Wonder now falls under the roof of an independent foundation, no longer the FHH, who, however hard they tried, could not really be dissociated from the Richmond Group. So now a new committee will be in charge, including naturally Rolex, Patek and the Richmond Group brand, with Jean-Frédéric Dufour, Rolex CEO, taking the head role of this uh, foundation's mission. And I really hope this will trigger some needed adaptation of the show. I mean, you know my opinion about it, and I hope it uh, will become a new federating event for the greater good of the industry, and that we will see many more brands joining the party as well as opening it more to the public. But so far, I have to say that this might not happen overnight. So for instance, many of the cool players of the independent scene have already said that they won't participate, brands uh, such as MBNF, Over, H. Moser, and these, I believe, uh, they are fundamental in maintaining some hype and freshness. So much of this is due to the high cost of participating at the event, and I really think that the organizers should differentiate the, the financial uh, involvements depending on the type of brands. So I propose that we should have three different sections, each section corresponding to a certain level of hospitality, whether on the type of booth and services brand will use, uh, meaning three levels of cost. And to determine in which category your brand falls, well, this should or could be determined by the overall turnover of the brand. So for instance, below 10 million, between 10 and 50 or 100 million, and the final one for the big players above 100 million. Okay, this would imply that we would more or less know the turnover of these brands, but I think that the range between each category, I mean, is large enough not to divulge any strategic secrets. And by doing so, I mean, the show could really open its door to many more players. And I would love to know that Watches and Wonders would become the absolute mecca of watchmaking events in the terms of, I mean, denseness and meaningfulness. And if you're a category three player below 10 million, but you still want to play in the big league, well, I mean, it's up to you to spend the money how you want it. But this shouldn't prevent some of the small, uh, smaller players in participating in a show where we would uh, find more or less the entire watchmaking ecosystem in terms of brands under one same roof. 
Okay, I doubt uh, it will ever be enough to convince uh, Swatch Group brands to participate, but in the long run, I think uh, their position could hurt them. So, well, who knows? And I mean, you guys are well aware of my positive mindset. So one day, who knows? The entire watchmaking family pulling in the same direction? Well, yeah, that would be nice, right? Okay, let's now talk about uh, new timepieces. And I have to say that I've been uh, quite surprised uh, by the heavy activity seen recently. And we selected just a few of these pieces for you. Actually, I was discussing this uh, with some friends the other day. And since already many years, I mean, the more adaptive brands quickly understood uh, not to divulge all their yearly new timepieces at the same time, i.e. Basel or SHH. But to spread this out and occupy the media scene, in particular, uh, the new social media one, and throughout the year, and to do so throughout the year. But then the big players started adapting their strategy too. Even Patek had a few yearly releases. But now it goes to the point that even Rolex is releasing watches outside of the yearly event. So let's start with Patek Philippe. As for the market, it was apparently a stunning appearance of the discontinued uh, Nautilus although quite an ambiguous one. As some say, the true novelty is something old but uh, well forgotten. In the Nautilus case, well, it was not all well forgotten, but the slight difference with the previous model, the 5711, uh, made uh, me think of an old Volvo promo campaign when the brand announced that their cars are exceptional excellency. So the only update has to, that has to be made is the bigger spacing between the letters in the rear emblem in order to enhance its visibility. And it looks like Patek uh, made kind of the same move. So instead of uh, stainless steel, uh, the new Nautilus is now made of 18 karat or white gold and is one millimeter bigger than his predecessor, 41 instead of 40 for the model 5711. So the overall design stays the same as it was uh, sketched by Gérald Janta uh, himself in the 70s and no change uh, to the movement uh, from its predecessor, the automatic 26 slash 330 SC movement with an 18 karat gold rotor. So not a surprise uh, that the new Nautilus is not a limited edition, but with this, I think Patek is just letting people know that access to their pieces has been slightly elevated since this model will retail around 60,000 Swiss franc, kind of a natural uh, selection process. Okay, next piece with Omega and the Omega Coaxial Master Chronometer 1932. A brand new movement uh, has been created for two watches that fully integrate a split second chronograph and a minute repeater. It took the company six years to create this beautifully um, you know, finished mechanism to make Omega sound like a, a proper chiming watch from the past centuries, which is great. I mean, yet doing it uh, differently as this piece will actually chime the result of the chrono, not of the hour. So one sound for the minutes, another for the intervals of 10 seconds and a third one for the actual remaining seconds. So that, I mean, that's quite cool, I must admit. But the only limit is that it will be able to do so over a max period of 15 minutes uh, of 15 measured minutes. So in my opinion, the movement is great and Omega will sell some of the watches for its high retail price of almost half a million, which is a bit crazy for a Speedmaster, even with such a high-end mechanism. Although it might even uh, rise bigger at the secondary market, making this watch a valuable collectible for the Omega aficionados. But the main goal here, in my opinion, is to increase the, uh, the value of the brand, which frankly uh, speaking might look a little bit strange after the recent and so successful affordable moon swatch, which uh, almost instantly became a legend. Okay, I doubt it was Omega's decision to come up with this one, but nonetheless, I believe uh, it's the marketing coup of the year. So I totally understand the effort of Omega to do uh, to be something uh, bigger than the first watch uh, to be on the moon, but the reference is still so strong, and for the brand with uh, middle-range retail prices, you should have a certain nerve to jump straight to the upper looks like this. All right, moving on with the new releases. Uh, here we have a nice collaboration of an independent brand with a retailer, something not exceptional, of course. And we are used to such uh, friendly alliances between the brands, artists, and designer. But it is always great to see how one partnership can enhance the brand and its DNA and make one timepiece even more desirable. But back to our timepiece here. So this watch is the fruit of the combined work of uh, La Maison Laurent Ferrier and Project 8 which is a barine based a retailer of innovative independent brands from around the world. So the design of the classic origin Sablé Autumn comes from Laurent Ferrier classic origin, but with a subtle twist of a shimmery sunblasted dial that looks like desert sand. So the little signature right above the sub dial at six o'clock is hardly noticeable and it adds to the feeling that the dial is covered 
in sand powder. And I like the contrast between the golden color of the dial and the cobalt blue numerals of a 24-hour scale. So delicate and elegant. It kind of reminds me of my second home, Sweden. <laughs> so this model is housed in a 40mm grade 5 titanium case and holds the manual wand uh, caliber LF116.01 uh, presented two years ago by Laurent Ferrier for the brand's 10th anniversary. So this caliber is less complicated than some of the company's creation, but suits perfectly for this watch, which is limited to only eight pieces and available directly from Project 8 for the price of around 30,000 uh, 37,000 US dollars. My opinion, it is a good choice if you want an elegant, high quality, affordable watch from the highly acclaimed Maison that you can easily wear with jeans or a tux without fear of being robbed in broad daylight. You know, that has its advantages. Okay, moving on to another watch and another collaboration. Uh, one of the well-known independent German brand, Moritz Grossmann, and an internationally uh, renowned watch photographer and artist, Atom Moore. So the pure lines and colors of the case are reinforced by the simplicity of the design of the dial, and the latter is a direct reference to the name of the artist, whose trademark became uh, the Atom symbol, with the uh, superimposed ellipses that uh, represent electrons orbiting the atomic nucleus. So to some extent, the, dial, uh, the design of the dial uh, resembles some artistic work of another great artist, M.C. Escher, and I have the same feeling of being quite mesmerized uh, by the image. So the watch is crafted in a stainless steel case, 37 mm in width, 9.2 mm in height, and inside there is a hand-wound caliber 102-.1, known for its uh, high artistic hand finish, which uses 188 uh, components, including 22 jewels and three gold uh, chatons, running at a frequency of 21,600 uh, oscillations uh, per hour, and the time-only movement has a power reserve of 48 hours. I can't say that this is a huge innovation because we've heard about this movement since 2019, but it is for sure a technical beauty. And as I mentioned before, while well, the dial is indeed one of the interesting features of this Atom More 37, and the finely grained silver dial is handmade using 19th century plating by friction technology revived precisely by Morris Grossman. This process was widespread in the pre-industrial era and was often used in Glashütte, the home of the brand, and did not require any electricity. So if you're lucky enough, uh, well, you can try to catch this watch uh, through the official retailer of uh, Morris Grossman in New York. But, I mean, chances are low because the Atom uh, More 37 is available uh, as a limited edition of seven pieces, with uh, uh, Atom More uh, himself having the zero on seven model. Next on our long list of novelties is another collaboration of an exceptional artist and a watchmaker. Platinum Sea by Romain Gauthier and Anita Porchet is more of an art piece than a wristwatch. It has no complication, only the sub-dial with small seconds that I really like in this particular piece. And these uh, red uh, subtle lines are uh, uneven in length, which uh, gives an impression of an exotic flower that pops out uh, from, the, uh, from its leaves. So the botanical design of the main uh, dial takes inspiration from uh, century botanical illustration and the spiritual reverence uh, found in Chinese ink wash paintings. It brings a touch of freshness to this timepiece, although using enamel paint is not new and other brands have done so repeatedly. But when you have the legendary Anita Porsche with you, well, this sets it slightly apart. What is interesting is that the hand-wound uh, Romain Gauthier movement with 60 hours of power reserve is made of 18 karat white gold. And if you want to know more about uh, the Continuum collection, well, we had a special uh, report on it, link below. So needless to say that uh, this watch is a unique timepiece and it was created for Time for Art auction, which will be a part of Philips' uh, New York watch auction in December 2022. Let's go to something uh, less classy and even a bit uh, geeky. The new Orberg UR120, aka Spock timepiece, and some of you may have already seen this one. And it's a tribute to the sci-fi classics, which uh, grew up uh, several generations of Dreamer. And Felix Baumgartner and Martin Fry are surely among them, because this time they seriously pulled the limits and decided to boldly go where no one has gone before. But let me explain everything. 
At the first glance, faithful fans of Overk might recognize the wandering hour display system of the brand, but the new generation UR120 is something quite mind-blowing and a nice update to their signature satellite system. Inside the self-winding UR20.01 caliber, each of the rotating satellites splits open and spin on its own axis when time is changing and then shuts to display the new hour uh, unit. And it's simply mesmerizing to observe. So the V-shaped split of the satellites uh, takes its inspiration from the Vulcan salute. Okay, I can't really make it, but you want to know what I mean. And trackers, uh, well, I mean, this is obviously well known to trackers, and technically this is one of the craziest innovation of Verver, considering the impeccable engineering of the inside mechanism. It is quite impressive that they have them so slim. At 44 mm long, 47 mm wide, and 15.8 uh, mm thick, the Spock watch uh, still looks quite elegant and futuristic at the same time. Plus, the upper part of the case is totally smooth without a single screw or notch, which gives the idea of a spaceship. Not a limited edition in pieces, but this time limited in production, and seriously something to admire. What, what else can I say? Live long and prosper, right? Something like that. <laughs> and something else uh, which uh, just came in with the launch of a very special titanium Rolex, a metal which has never been used by the crown, and as often with them, the metal has a special name. It is called RLX Titanium, and it is, a, it is an alloy of titanium grade 5 with some Rolex secrets within, which uh, have not been disclosed and probably will never be. So to make the story short, it is a very similar piece than the one that went down the 10,898 meters under the sea level on March 26, 2012. On the outside of the Deep Sea Challenger, a deep diving submersible piloted, uh, piloted by James Cameron, and he was inside of the, the uh, submersible while the experimental watch was on the outside and endured the pressure of the Mariana Trench. So to make this experimental piece into a sellable product was a bit complicated, especially considering its weight as it was made out of steel. Uh, and thick one, and now with the use of this RLX uh, titanium, well, it is enabled. It enabled to reduce uh, this weight by 30%. However, it is still a 50 millimeter diameter watch, so that's big. And if you really wanted to have people know you're wearing Rolex, well, then this one will work for sure for you. And Rolex being Rolex, well, it's uh, tested at a pressure of 11,000 meter plus 25%, meaning 13,750 meters under the, uh, the sea level. But that place, of course, doesn't really exist. Who cares? And on the production level, it is interesting to mention that almost all titanium parts are satin polished, but uh, the areas near the crown and the crown are mirror polished, something uh, which can be quite uh, challenging. And last but not least, uh, Rolex has now a new mark on its crown to denominate, uh, denominate the new metal they are using. And this piece uh, should be available in November and really retailing at the price around 26,000 uh, Swiss francs and well, we just know it will sell. Okay, and for the next and final timepiece, let's go more affordable and nonetheless interesting with the Essence of Joy by Formex, coming, coming with a malachite gemstone dial. So quite a smart, casual and stylish 39 millimeter watch. Small and accurate is definitely, uh, well, it will definitely fit everyone's wrist because you can choose the size of your strap. I mean, the cool thing about this watch is the signature case suspension system that has been an integral part of every single Formex timepiece since the birth of the brand in 1999. So it's similar to a car, or a sport bike, or a VTT uh, system. It absorbs a shock to protect mechanical movement from the heavy impacts, uh, which makes this piece a perfect sports watch in a certain way. I mean, all the, because I'm not sure that with the Malachi dial, you would like to go too wild. I mean, because the stone itself is quite soft, uh, so the suspension system is more of a necessity here. Plus, the case adapts to your wrist for additional comfort, and the SN39, uh, uh, or the Essence of Joy, is water resistant to 100 meters, and the stainless steel case weighs only 65 gram, and it is powered by Celita's uh, highest quality grade SW200-1 uh, Swiss made automatic movement, officially certified by COS. And on the case back, you can actually see a custom built uh, skeleton rotor with uh, thermally blued screws. So the essence of joy can be customized with uh, five different straps, uh, each matching the, the vibrant green color of the dial. And as this is a genuine uh, gemstone, well, you can never have the, uh, the, the dial, the same dial, even if it's not uh, limited edition. What? So, but here it comes. So it's kind of not bad at all for a retail price of approximately 1.5 thousand Swiss franc. So I told you, I mean, this was more affordable. 
Okay, we're finally reaching the end of this prime time, and beside all the Geneva activity we wanted to mention, that we mentioned, also wanted to say that if you're in London on the 11th and 12th of November, well, WatchPro will be holding their very own salon, taking place at the Londoner Hotel on Leicester Square, with approximately 30 brands present on site, and I'm pretty sure it will be a really nice event to attend. So I don't know yet if I'll be there, but hopefully so. So you'll find a link below if you want to know more info to, in terms of how to get there. London, 11th and 12th. So yeah, now it's finally over. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks uh, to our patrons and see you real soon. And by the way, we have a cool video coming, uh, having been invited for a very special event, the 50th anniversary of the release of the movie The Godfather. So I guess you know which brand and which watch I am talking about. It was really amazing. Okay, all the very best and viva watchmaking!